uh, on the call here is um, boss and co-owner of Albert Lee Seed, Mac Earhart, and myself. Oops. Yeah, well, Matt's opening that up. Um, just wanted to say thank you to everybody for joining us. Really appreciate you taking time out of your day. And like Matt said, please ask questions in the chat box as we go. It makes it uh, more interesting for everybody if, we're, if we have a little bit of give and take. Uh, also, thanks to Matt for helping to organize this. There's a whole group of people that put our annual conference together, and it's quite a bit of work. And uh, Matt leads the charge. So I want to say thank you to Matt up front for all the work that he's done on this. Great. Uh, all right. Um, so um, you've already heard me and Max speak. Uh, we were going to have my colleague Jake Hansen um, involved in this presentation as well, but unfortunately he couldn't uh, be with us today as he had a family emergency. Um, so it'll just be myself and Mac. Uh, but certainly, um, if any questions come up um, that are kind of leaving you with some lingering questions, my colleague Jake is uh, the corn soybeans production manager here. So, and he's a really good resource uh, for anyone. Um, and you can still pick up the phone and get in touch with him or send us an email after the fact if, if any other specific questions come up for you. Um, so just wanted to do a quick call out on our website. If you haven't visited our website um, in the last six months or so, um, we did revamp it about fully about a year ago and are constantly kind of uh, evolving it. A couple of things I would call out uh, is that if you'd like to follow along with what we're talking about today, um, if you go to our website, which is www.alseed.com, and then you click on products, you can kind of follow along with what specific things we're talking about. Um, another call out I might add is um, on the top there is trial data. Um, and that is a really interesting uh, portion of our website that we constantly update every year. Um, with trial data, not only on uh, corn and soybeans, but small grains, forages. Um, uh, it kind of runs the gamut of a whole range of uh, replicated and uh, strip trials across the upper Midwest on um, all of the crops that we, we've got, not quite all, but a good portion of the crops that we've got on our website. Um, so definitely that's um, an important uh, tool for you all uh, to look at. Um, as you're kind of thinking through seed decisions for this coming year. Obviously, if, um, if, uh, if you'd like to request a paper catalog in person or kind of view that online, you can also go to the catalogs uh, tab on the upper right hand side and request a, a paper guide as well. Um, so just jumping right into um, uh, corn and organic corn specifically for 2022, um, I wanted to kind of put this up here for you all to give, give a sense and, and orient you about what we think about um, when we're selecting hybrids and varieties to roll out specifically for organic producers. Because the truth is, uh, we understand intimately that the needs of organic producers are not equivalent to the needs of conventional producers. There's different um, uh, crop rotations to consider. There's different um, machinery different management techniques, uh, different availability of nutrients. I mean, all those things are extremely important uh, for us to keep in the back of our minds when we're thinking of seed varieties um, uh, to either trial or to roll out um, in a commercial setting. Um, and we go through our whole internal process of, you know, kind of vetting uh, potential seed hybrids and varieties before we, before we launch them. And this is kind of our internal rubric that we came uh, came up with uh, to kind of guide our thinking on what are the most important characteristics that we think um, are important when we're launching an organic uh, corn hybrid. And this may not be exactly mirroring what uh, the needs are of organic producers on the farm. Uh, for example, when we're as a seed company thinking through what hybrids are going to make um, a, a good position in our lineup, things like seed reproducibility and seed quality are things that we obviously want to take into account that wouldn't necessarily be um, applicable to, to farmers. But um, kind of going down the line here, we, we like uh, to think through and have varied choices uh, by maturity. So, you know, being that there's fewer organic seed entities out there, you know, we need to be able to think through and supply folks, organic folks, all the way from northern Minnesota down to 
Missouri, uh, and even Texas. Um, and, you know, east west going from Colorado all the way east to uh, Vermont and Maine and upstate New York. So that's a really wide geography uh, to, to service. And we need to have a, a good amount of adaptability in genetics to kind of match a lot of those um, varied geographies, varied rotations, um, and varied farm systems. Um, emergence and early growth, you'll notice that um, you know, for a lot of conventional producers, yield is the number one concern and probably maybe one of one of three top concerns that they they utilize when selecting hybrids. And not to say that yield is not extremely important, it, it absolutely is, but you'll see that other characteristics for us, uh, and this again speaks to the kind of tailoring seed needs to specific uses of organic producers, um, that Things like emergence and early growth are, you know, as as important, if not more so important, um, than selecting things specifically for yield. Because the reality is, if if a corn hybrid doesn't come out of the ground fast and compete with weeds, it's not going to play in an organic rotation. Same thing with with dry down and height. Um, a hybrid needs to be um, uh, competitive with with the weeds that are going to be there in an organic rotation. Um, it's got to be a situation and the, the hybrids have to perform under different sets of conditions uh, than would be present in a conventional rotation. Uh, ear flex is often very important as well. You might get in an organic context uh, variable emergence or variable populations, especially if, you're, if uh, weed control is tearing out a few uh, plants in the row. So being, having hybrids that are able to compensate for that uh, is very important and, and part of our thinking. Um, obviously yield and yield stability. I would probably emphasize the second part of that uh, most importantly. It's great, it's great to win trials, but it's more important to see consistent yield performance year in and year out, especially with variability in rainfall and differences in climatic patterns. We want to make sure that we have consistent high yielding um, seed varieties uh, to release for you all. Um, root and stock strength, pretty typical. Same thing with drought tolerance. That's going to be, um, as we all experienced this year, uh, definitely a paramount concern moving forward and, and want to make sure that uh, we're constantly evaluating hybrids that uh, perform uh, given inconsistent moisture or being able to withstand as much as possible, um, you know, torrential rainfall. Um, so drought tolerance, wet ground tolerance, also important, kind of speaks to that adaptability piece and um, hybrids being able to perform under multiple different conditions. And uh, I would just close with uh, quality. You know, obviously um, a lot of organic producers are not just hauling their grain uh, to the nearest elevator. There's often um, additive quality metrics that organic producers are trying to meet, whether that's a GMO threshold or protein. Um, there's other quality metrics that add to the value added portion of organic. And that's definitely something we, we keep as top of mind as we're uh, releasing hybrids. Matt, I would add one thing to that last slide, um, which is that uh, historically Viking organics has been focused on grain. About five years ago, we started to turn and face that silage market because so much organic corn ends up going through uh, an animal. And so we now um, have a pretty strong lineup of hybrids that are also uh, that are also adapted for silage use, and we call those grain silage hybrids or GS hybrids. So we don't have uh, silage specific hybrids, leafy hybrids, brown midrib hybrids. Instead, we focus on hybrids that are so-called dual purpose hybrids that can either be used for grain or for silage. And we don't give them that GS designation unless we actually have data on them showing them not only to produce a lot of tonnage but also to produce a lot of milk per acre. So I just wanted to add that. Thanks. Yeah, and I'll, I'll kind of um, serve this up to you, Mac, uh, to kind sure. of lay out again yet yet another characteristic that we're that we think through in terms of organic seed uh, that you know is pretty specific to that marketplace. Yeah. So I, several years back, we launched our pure and ultra pure brands, and this is essentially analogous to the non-GMO. Um, label you see like in a grocery store. And this is a big deal for our customers and, and really has, has been, a, a, I think, an important part of the growth of our company to actually put a guarantee on the bag and on the tag that says how much GMO is in the seed in that bag. And um, 
So if it comes, uh, if it comes with that Viking Ultra Pure logo, that means that we guarantee that it's 99.9% .9 GMO free, right? So it doesn't guarantee that it won't be cross contaminated by by neighboring pollen or that there could be other sources of contamination, but it does guarantee that the seed that you're planting is uh, the seed that you're planting is basically GMO free. And we've had really good success with that ultra pure, you know, knock on wood. Um, in the five years we've been doing this now, we've never had a positive test on any of the hybrids that we've labeled ultra pure. So pretty proud of that. And it it was an industry leading guarantee and something that that we're uh, that we're pushing ahead on. We also have that now in some of our soybean varieties. And this year for the first time, we have it in some alfalfa varieties. And then we have a, a sister label, the Viking Pure label, which guarantees 99% GMO free. So see that we're not quite able to get up to that essentially GMO free label comes to the, with the Viking Pure logo. If the seed that you buy doesn't have either of those labels on it, it it, uh, it could have a higher percent than 1% uh, GMO. And if you have specific questions about that, give us a call. It's important, We've uh, a value of our company is transparency and we want people to know and be confident about the seed that they're planting. So if you're getting seed and it doesn't come with one of those two labels, don't be afraid to ask us because we're happy to share the information. So I'll jump in and talk about hybrids a little bit. Uh, the first three hybrids that I'm gonna talk about are new for 2022. Um, all three of these hybrids are also being have have been in the conventional marketplace recently. Either they're new launches or were launched last year. We go through an additional year of selection normally just to make certain about emergence and early season growth because it's such a key piece for organic farmers. But these are three very competitive hybrids. We're proud to launch them, and two of them were able to launch ultra pure. Uh, which is pretty exciting for us to have two new uh, hybrids on the early side for ultra pure. That 89 day, the 5289. Um, uh, one thing Matt didn't really mention in going through that slide was because organic farmers traditionally plant three to four to five weeks later than their neighbors, not always, but usually in order to get that first flush of weeds work down, they're planting, they're dragging early hybrids farther south out of their normal zone of adaptation. And so we are always looking for hybrids that can handle that southerly movement, that, can, that have the health and in stock integrity in the fall to be moved farther south in their normal zone of adaptation. And both of these uh, first two hybrids, the 89 day and the 93 day, really have excellent southerly movement. We're not afraid to see them in southern Minnesota, uh, northern Iowa, even across Wisconsin, um, and, and certainly in New York State. Um, they've just shown excellent southerly movement and intactness in the fall. They both also showed really good drought tolerance this year, which we we're excited about. We haven't labeled either of them as a GS hybrid yet. We're doing additional testing on them to decide whether they're gonna be suitable for silage, but both of them have a lot of yield um, and really good fall intactness and early season vigor. So excited about those two. On the later side, uh, there's a new hybrid replacing, uh, essentially it's gonna knock out or be a sister, I guess the right way to say it is, be a companion hybrid to 4808, which is 108 day that's been extremely popular. Um, you can see the bottom bullet point on that hybrid in, in our 2019, 2020 testing, it added about 10 bushels to 4808. This year again, um, in our 2021 testing, it, add, it added about nine bushels and that's over 12 locations across Iowa, Nebraska, Illinois. It's, it's adding additional yield. It's also got really um, uh, nice health, good emergence and exceptional green snap tolerance. So this hybrid is another one that may eventually be um, a, a GS hybrid, but we don't have it labeled that way yet because we haven't finalized the testing. And again, if you folks have questions about any of these, just snap them into the, the chat box and we'll try to answer them. Uh, we're not going to talk about every hybrid that we sell because it, it would just uh, it would get pretty boring. And we're, so we're just going to touch some highlights in addition to the new hybrids I just spoke of. Um, we're going to compare and contrast some of our existing hybrids just to clarify some things. So one is one important thing to know is uh, we are sold out of Viking 8495, which is our best selling 95 day organic hybrid. But the good news is we have two really excellent hybrids right around it. Actually three, if you include the 7293 from the previous slide, which is on the early side of 8495, but very competitive with it. Um, so we've got a really nice uh, lineup of corn from that 93 to 97 day here. And these two hybrids are great companions to the 8495. So the 5296 is actually a sister hybrid. It shares a female parent with 8495. So same female, different male. The male brings additional plant health. Um, it actually brings better emergence 
Um, in most cases, it also brings a um, little bit taller and additional yield. So in our data for the last three years, it's kind of consistently on high, on high yield ground, it's added anywhere from six to 10 bushels to 8495. So bringing additional yield in high yield environments to the 8495. And we learned, the one thing we were a little nervous about with 5296 was we weren't sure that it was really gonna be as drought tolerant as 8495, which has just been a real stout hybrid in, on sandier soils or in drought conditions. And actually 5296 came through 2021 really, really well with excellent drought tolerance. So feel really good about that hybrid all around. Um, may not have quite as good a test weight as the 8495, but it's still a very good test weight hybrid. So we really like that one. On the later side, 4597, flowers a little later than the 5296 or the 8495, but actually dries down about exactly the same. They're within half a point of each other all the time. So it's really, even though we call it a 97 day because it flowers a bit later, it really dries down like a 95 day. Excellent top end yield potential. The nice thing about this hybrid, again, excellent emergence, so really better emergence than the 8495, and also uh, a taller plant, um, so you get a little better weed shading later in the season as well. Um, one, of the, one of the gripes about 8495 is that it isn't a very tall hybrid, where 4597 brings a lot of additional height. Um, widely adapted, and also this one has very good test weight. All right, uh, these two hybrids, um, the 8500, the 100 day, uh, which we launched last year, has got a lot of top end yield and a lot of toughness. So this has the same female parent as 8495 as well, but it brings it five days later, so a true 100 day. But it brings that toughness that 8495 has, ability to handle droughty soils, uh, go west across northern Nebraska even, uh, and also has a very good easterly movement. So at 100 days, this is just an outstanding product for toughness and versatility. Probably strictly a grain hybrid, not a, not a silage option at all, but um, really good overall plant health. You can see there, it's got above average tolerance to tar spot, which for most organic farmers hasn't been a significant problem yet, but uh, something to look out for. And this does have that um, above average tolerance to tar spot. Again, the really good drought tolerance and uh, good, good stocks and roots. The 4602 um, should have a slide of its own because <laughs> it just keeps winning trials or coming in top 10 in trials across Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin. Uh, it's just a really high yielding 102 day corn with a, an outstanding performance on organic farms as well. Again, primarily a grain hybrid, um, not really a silage option, but just an outstanding 102 day grain hybrid. Um, and I, we don't have, a, I saw Jake didn't put this slide in here, but this came in first or second or third in a whole bunch of first trials in our conventional lineup. Uh, actually, we interestingly, um, for folks that think, oh, the organic hybrids are just left over, they're not as good as the conventionals. We launched this as an organic hybrid first, and it performed so well that we that the following year we launched it in our conventional lineup. So just a, a really solid product. I might mention too on the 4602 that it, um, it has the, the health and adaptability to, to move south as a really, really hybrid too. So we've mm -hmm. had this even in uh, central, you know, to, to northern Ohio and it's performed very well as well. And same, same story in Illinois uh, would likely repeat in, in Indiana too. So that that's kind of a nice early option for, for folks that far south. Yep, I agree. Uh, 510, so these are, these are both uh, GS hybrids. So they have that, the P is for pure and the GS is for grain silage. So both these hybrids are excellent grain hybrids and they've got the yield data to back it up, both in our internal data where we do lots of internal replicated testing uh, but also externally where we've put them in yield trials and state yield trials and first trials, these hybrids have competed extremely well uh, against not only conventional hybrids, but also traded hybrids. So lots of top end yield, but they also both are excellent silage products with not only good tonnage, but also really good um, characteristics that give you lots of milk per acre. Um, and we've got the data to back that up, although I don't have it on this slide. So feel really confident in, in both of these products uh, for silage hybrids. I know Jake just told me he's not on the call today, but 
Uh, University of Minnesota released their silage trials this year, and the 8214 did extremely well in those silage trials. 5104 has done extremely well in the past, uh, and we've had it for a while, and it's become a, a favored product for silage as well. 8214, I'll just add, sorry, Matt, but that hybrid at 114 day does have some tropical uh, germplasm in the background, and it can go all the way south into Texas. Um, and, this, and the very most southern states with that tropical germplasm enables it to make that, that southerly movement. Yeah, so um, we have a, overall a very good supply of organic hybrid seed corn. Like I mentioned, we are sold out of 8495. There will be a few other hybrids that we sell out of, but overall we have plenty of corn and prices are mostly flat. There's a few that are up $5, but um, in general, they're the same prices that we've had for the last three years. Uh, and I already have talked about how competitive the genetics are, so I won't, I won't go over that again. Great. Thanks, Mac. Um, kind of um, doing the same thing as we spotlight uh, soybeans, uh, we're just going to kind of um, step back a bit and think about what characteristics we think through when we're, um, you know, considering launching uh, a soybean variety for certified organic producers. Um, again, you know, the, the the characteristics and the um, the uh, of the varieties that we're looking at are are definitely uh, unique to an organic rotation. Uh, there's not a lot of uh, direct applicability between the conventional rotation and an organic rotation. Um, you know, as it relates to uh, picking varieties that have you know sufficient height and weed competitive ability. Um, you know, is huge in. Um, an organic rotation. Um, another another characteristic that's pretty specific to organic um, that really doesn't play into a conventional rotation at all is aphid tolerance. Um, and this is um, non-genetically modified, um, you know, traditionally bred genetic resistance to soybean aphids. And there's various um, resistance genetics that are in kind of the soybean breeding marketplace right now. There's been just uh, single modes of action. Uh, but a lot of the newest varieties that have come out that we've um, kind of taken ownership over are uh, two modes of action against soybean aphids. And, you know, traditionally, at least within the last three to four years, soybean aphids haven't been as big of a widespread concern for organic producers. Um, you know, but in those years where aphids are really bad and very prevalent, um, you know, it can, having an aphid tolerant uh, soybean can definitely mean the difference between, you know, getting a decent yield and just getting completely hammered um, out in the field. Um, and those were uh, genetics that came out of Iowa State. Um, and we're actually one of the, uh, we, we almost uh, kind of took uh, that under our wing and have continued on uh, that breeding effort with those soybeans. Because um, the reality is, you know, conventional producers can spray for aphids if they ever become an issue um, for very, you know, inexpensive costs. So this is something that is unique to organic producers and something we'll continue moving forward with um, in both the near term and the long term. Yeah, I would and, just add to what Matt said there. There are other breeding programs that we're supporting that are working with aphid tolerance now as well. Um, and we're either supporting them financially or supporting them with through licensing fees. Some of them we're working with directly on developing new aphid tolerant lines. Great. Yeah, thanks for that clarification. Um, so again, you know, on this internal list for us, um, you know, you'll, you'll notice that yield is number four. That's not to say that uh, yield is not a paramount concern. It absolutely is. But a lot of those, char those growth characteristics and other um, unique abilities of uh, soybean varieties that we're considering launching for organic um, often take precedence over just the highest yielding bean on every acre every year. Because uh, most organic folks due to, you know, weed pressures specifically are never usually reaching the yield ceiling of these uh, varieties. Um, so we want to make sure that, you know, again, yield performance and yield stability is, is obviously very important with soybeans being where they are price wise, you want to make sure you're getting maximum yield, but uh, to get maximum yield, you know, they have to come out of the ground, they have to compete and they have to stand and they have to be able to withstand disease and pest issues. Um, I think so the again, way that I'm going to jump in, Matt. So the way yeah. I would think about it is um, like, obviously yield is super important. And the reason it's not at the top is that we, we feel like those other characteristics come first, but 
That doesn't mean that we don't have uh, soybeans that will compete with the highest yielding uh, soybeans out there. It just means there are some varieties that we're never going to launch organically, primarily if they're too short or if they have a really um, what we would call a thin line or even a, a, a not even a real medium bush. So if they're a narrow or plant type, they just don't work well in an organic environment. There's other things that factor into that too. So weighing all those things together, we're going to choose the highest yielding available lines that also are suitable for organic production. The one other thing I would add to this list before we move forward is we are and have started to think about uh, you see at the very bottom of the slide, there's a little picture of, of a roll down rye situation. And since that is becoming a more and more common practice organically, we are starting to think starting, excuse me, we are starting to think about um, starting to select varieties based on their ability to emerge through a thick uh, amount of matter like that. So biomass, there can be a lot of biomass on the surface of the soil. And sub soybeans have a really short hypocotyl and some have longer hypocotyls. And there may be other factors as well that contribute to the success of a soybean emerging in a roll down rye situation. And we don't understand them all yet, but it's something that we're thinking about um, characterizing our soybeans for their suitability in roll down rye environment. And then again, you know, we, we serve as such a wide geography of the United States States that we need beans that can go multiple different places and be able to perform consistently, uh, be able to withstand disease issues in each of those individual places, as well as kind of your common um, soybean diseases that you see out there. Obviously, standability is really big, um, you know, for long term, especially under, you know, situations with high weed pressure, uh, maturity groups, and also uh, maturity groups, like Mac mentioned, for corn, you know, often organic producers are planting uh, you know, quite a bit later than their conventional neighbors and earlier maturing soybeans that can, that can move, uh, move across the geography and still be successful uh, is, is, is very much uh, top of mind when we're considering uh, soybean genetics, as well as specialty characteristics like, you know, clear hilum soybeans or soybeans that can match a protein uh, contract uh, for value-added uh, markets in the organic um, space is, is definitely important as well. So yeah, yeah, so we'll guess. just jump into some of these varieties. I will mention here, you will see the little badge on some of these varieties. It says pure. That means the variety is guaranteed to be 99% pure uh, or 99% free of GMOs. In practice, they're all going to be at least 99.5. Otherwise, we're not going to sell them. So they're much purer than that. But rather than make a new label, <laughs> we stuck with the, the pure and the ultra pure labels. And we do have some soybeans with the ultra pure label, and those tend to be the food types. So the first one is uh, actually not a new bean. It's Viking 0821. It was new last year. And this bean is just so impressive. Um, this won the University of Minnesota trial in 2020 uh, in the central zone. It beat all of the E3s and Roundup Ready to Extend and whatever beans. It was the top yielding bean out of about 70 in the University of Minnesota central zone. This year, same zone, same place. It came in second. So just a tremendous amount of top end yield. But the other thing that it does is it moves south really well. I think I saw that um, Bob Pearson's on the call and he's seen this bean in Northern Iowa. Um, and it just is, it, it maintains, unlike some early beans that we've had and uh, the, the one some of you may remember was Minnesota 0810, which did not move south very well. This bean moves south, maintains its height, stays bushy, gives you decent weed control and really, really competitive yields. So that's a, that is a, a stayer. Unfortunately, it's not a yellow hilum, but it does, it's so far, you know, knock on wood, it's doing everything else really well with a, with a lot of top end yield for late planting or replanting in, in the Northern zones and for folks or in the central zones and for people way up North. Um, yeah, it's, there's nothing out there that's gonna beat it for yield. Uh, 1718 is a, is a new one for us. We've, 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 uh, been, I don't know, some of you on this call have probably been customers of ours for a long time. We've had Viking 1706 for what, 15 years or something like that. We, <laughs> we've had that been for, with the company. I've been here yeah. for seven years. So, so 1706 been a great organic bean. It's somewhat has a little bit of a glass ceiling for top end yield, and it didn't look particularly good uh, this year. It seemed like it had some lodging issues. This is a brand new variety that definitely has a lot more top end yield in 1706. 
Uh, it remains to be seen whether it's going to be as widely adapted for organic farmers because we don't really know until it gets out there on farms and you and we get feedback from you folks but so far so good it seems to have the, the it definitely has the emergence and it has the plant style that should be that should make it well suited for organic farming lots of top end yield and also really good all-around disease resistance um with with lots of powerful uh, or lots of good data behind it so and then in, and then on the late side we launched a new 3.1 um with a very very good top end yield potential. This is another feed grade dark hyalum bean. Um, excellent top end yield potential, really good all around disease resistance and, and, not, and a little bit taller plant, um, again, for weed, for weed shading and organic systems. Mac, we had a question come through the chat about um, the ability, going back to your statement about the organic roll down system yep. and whether or not uh, individual soybean varieties have been uh, selected or, or if there's a trait to select for under those conditions that can, so it means that can withstand uh, being rolled on um, or, you know, emerge to that amount of residue. Yeah, no. And so that's great question. And that is, I don't, it's not, <laughs> it's not a simple, that one can, that one can't. And it isn't as simple. The, the most obvious characteristic that we would select for would be hypocotyl elongation, which is something you can test for in a lab setting. You can do what's called a sand test where you plant the soybeans, I think it's four and a half inches deep, and just see how long that hypocotyl gets. But, but it doesn't always translate directly into how it's going to perform in a roll down system. I was more bringing that up to, to let you folks know that that's something we're thinking about. And we're thinking, we know that those roll down systems are becoming more and more prevalent. And we do believe there's going to be variety differences. And we, we're working to be able to characterize them so we can tell you, yeah, this one, this one would be excellent for that. And this one probably we wouldn't recommend for roll down rise systems. And I, I don't have a, a simple, at this point, not a simple way to characterize it other than to say we're working on it. Great, thanks. Um, these are not new beans, these are two of our probably biggest sellers on the organic side in these maturities 15 18 has just been so solid for our conventional custom customers and our organic customers with nice big bushy plant works really well on an organic system very good top end yield potential um, moves south extremely well as a late planted bean uh, and just has been an outstanding all around uh 1.5 soybean with a lot of adaptability, north, south, and east and west. Um, 1993, uh, I told the story of this bean before, how we launched this conventionally several years back. It never really caught on because it didn't win yield trials. It's just what I would call an extremely consistent performer. But I had a, a, a customer and a seed grower of ours who, who happened to have used this bean organically and said it was the best bean he'd ever planted organically. And uh, I said, well, that's what we need. So we brought it back, launched it organically, and it has really caught on. It just seems to really like organic systems. It's a nice, big, bushy plant again, and very consistent performance, fence row to fence row, very nice high yield potential. Again, a dark island bean, um, so it doesn't have everything going for it, but um, really nicely adapted to organic systems and then one of our best sellers. Um, 2155 is remains our best seller on the conventional side and one of our best sellers on the organic side, just a lot of top end yield potential uh, and broad adaptability. The one look out there is we have it rated as a 2.1. It's really more of a 2.3 in my mind. It, uh, it was brought to us by the genetic originator as a 2.1, but every year we look at it and say, mm, yeah, it's at least a 2.2, if not a 2.3. So it's, it's a little bit later than we rated it, but excellent all around top end yield potential and also um, nice big plant uh, that, that covers, covers the rows. So it gives, it gives you a lot of uh, uh, suppression of weeds. 2244 is one of the newer varieties. This is not an Iowa State variety. This is a stacked aphid tolerant uh, soybean out of a different program. Um, and again, we haven't had, as Matt mentioned, we haven't had a lot of aphids the last few years. Um, but if you think they're not going to come back with a vengeance at some point, you're kidding yourself because we're going to have a year where we do have a big aphid problem and 2244 is definitely going to rise to the top. I would say even in the absence of aphids, that's a really good bean, um, very competitive for yields. You can see in the second bullet point uh, in our trials, it was beating 2265, 2265, which was one of our best sellers for many years. Um, so a lot of top end yield potential as well. 
Uh, I think side by side with 2155, the 2155 in the absence of aphids is going to bring you a little more yield. But 2244 is a nice big plant. Um, and it's got very good yield potential. And if we do end up with aphids, it's really going to crush. It's, it's just an excellent all around variety. Oh, uh, somebody's sticky keys. Is that you, Matt? Yeah, there you go. 2418 um, really had a great year. Uh, we, again, uh, Jake's not on the call or he could list all the, all the soybean trials this year where it came in first, second or third. It just had outstanding yield performance across the soybean belt from Nebraska uh, out through Illinois and Ohio. Did, did very well in Ohio trials as well. Um, so really broadly adapted east to west, great top end yield potential and well adapted for organic systems. 2702 isn't winning trials for us, but it is winning hearts and minds on farms. Um, it's really uh, on farm performance has been really impressive in our internal data. It's also looked really good. So we're going to stick by this one. You can see it did awesome in 2020 in the University of Wisconsin trial. So I guess that gives the lie to my first statement. But uh, that's a bean we specifically selected for organic farms because of the plant stature uh, and the bushiness. And it also has outstanding yield potential. Um, again, a feed variety, not a yellow highland variety. Pricing and availability. Um, soybean prices, uh, no surprise to anybody on the call, are, are going to be higher this year. Why is that? Um, because, well, I'll talk about that in the next slide. We have, I think at this, at the, some point this fall, I looked, uh, Catherine did a report for me and we'd sold twice as much soybean seed, this organic soybean seed at that point, I think it was November 15th, maybe as we had the prior year. So people are definitely eager to plant soybeans for 2022 because the, the price, the price you can contract it for is so high and we get it. We do have pretty good availability. Eventually we will sell out of some varieties. Um, most most of the varieties we sell organically, not all of them, but most of them we also sell conventionally. So if we do sell out of organic seed, we should have conventional and treated seed available. Um, and we have a speaker later today that's going to talk about why the organic soybean market is so high right now. And most of you folks know the story that um, the Indian soy meal market was uh, cut off. Basically, there was an embargo put on by the USDA, and that's led to this 50% jump in, in soybean prices. So why, why are soybean prices, uh, soybean seed prices so high this year? Uh, a, we're paying our growers a lot more. The base price for most of our contracts is 32, and then you have to add a royalty, or not a royalty, a premium onto that. Royalties are also up. So the companies that are doing genetic uh, work on soybeans used to charge, we used to get varieties from the university. I've been around 30 years. We used to have licensed varieties from the university for 25 cents a unit. Uh, we have royalties now that are approaching $10 a unit. So those royalties are getting really high. Also seed size is large this year. And this is a tougher one to explain, but the basic concept is we buy our soybean seed by the bushel. So when we contract with an organic grower, we're paying them for all the bushels that they haul across our scale. But we sell that seed in most cases by the 140,000 seed units. So when soybean seed is big, and it is this year because of the late season rains that we had, it really affects uh, our cost in the bag. So you can see my little <clears throat> spreadsheet there. You can see the difference of just the raw material in the bag of between a Viking 1706 and a Viking E1993. That grain value, in other words, if we just dump the bag and haul it to the elevator, um, that's the difference in the value in the bag strictly because of the seed size. You see that, so that adds in this case, 38 and a half percent cost to the raw material in the bag. And that, and, and that is a big deal this year because all the seed is bigger. So if normally 1706 is 3,200 seeds per pound and this year it's 2,900, that, that adds you know, roughly 10% cost in the bag. And that's on top of the already high soybean prices. And by the way, that grain value in the bag doesn't include the grower premium, the trucking, the clean out, the cost of cleaning and packaging, or the royalties that I already mentioned. And so that's why soybean seed prices are so high this year. All right. So in the last uh, handful of minutes here, uh, we're probably going to run over by about five minutes. So we'll just shorten our break uh, to about 10 minutes here. But in the last few minutes, we'll just kind of uh, gloss over a few of the other sections we have here. So similar 
kind of framing uh, for organic yield selection criteria when we're thinking about launching varieties there, um, you know, yield is paramount, uh, but also having that adaptability piece, um, especially for northern climates, we want to have alfalfa that winters, because uh, alfalfa is planted over a wide, wide geography in the US and all the way from California through uh, Idaho and the montane states, you know, to the upper Midwest. Um, so varieties have to be able to perform across that wide geography, have appropriate disease tolerance. Um, also leaf hopper resistance, you know, that's another kind of uh, paramount concern for organic folks, whereas conventional folks can just spray uh, regardless of what the economic threshold is, uh, organic folks cannot and need resistant varieties uh, to kind of deal with that pest, as well as um, uh, the most important thing that we kind of uh, has been launched for us is adapting purity to alfalfa. So folks are aware that there is genetically modified alfalfa and um, starting about two years ago, we launched um, both pure and ultra pure for uh, organic alfalfa as well. And uh, for this coming season, uh, we're very happy that we have uh, not only one variety, but three varieties that are coming to us uh, with all different characteristics that are ultra pure. So that's 99.9% .9 free of GMO um, in the seed bag. And that's, that's a big deal. It's been a long-term uh, project um, and we are getting to a point now where we have commercial avail commercially available quantities of these three um, elite alfalfa. So kind of the 372 HD is in that class of an FD4, you know, four or five cut type alfalfa, uh, you know, a 30 day cutting window that you can get very high production out of. Um, it's very winter hardy and disease resistant. Um, so definitely very adaptable for any organic dairy rotation out there. Uh, yeah, just to state the obvious, HD stands for highly digestible. So we would put 372 HD up against any low lignin alfalfa out there. It really has outstanding characteristics for um, digestibility. Yep, yep. And then uh, 320 and 444 are kind of two tiers of the LH stands for leaf hopper resistance. These are our certified organic uh, alfalfas that have resistance to potato leaf hoppers. And that's actually a physical uh, resistance characteristic of the plant that uh, helps repel those insects. Um, and kind of two tiers of um, genetic resistance, there's multiple um, generations of resistance. So every generation, the resistance gets a little bit better. So there's kind of a, a differentiation there between those two varieties. Um, and also uh, cutting window is a little different uh, between the two, you know, in terms of productivity, but both excellent yielding um, organic leaf hopper alfalfas that come with that ultra pure badge. So yeah, and I would say the 444 is a very elite uh, leading edge alfalfa that just was launched within the last two years. So this is a this is about as good as it gets for alfalfa, uh, both in terms of the leaf hopper resistance and quality, winter hardiness, etc. It's just an outstanding all around alfalfa. So I expect we'll sell out of that one first. And not to discount our kind of existing alfalfas that um, come with just the pure badge as well. You know, kind of. Um, very high quality um, alfalfa, both an FD4 with Viking 3800 and an FD3 for Viking 340M that can uh, work uh, excellent in a, both a dairy rotation and a, a beef or a cash hay rotation as well um, that uh, we shouldn't discount. We have a very good supply of both of these alfalfas. Um, seed production, you know, contrary to what climatic issues we, we all experienced this year, we do have a good supply of organic alfalfa seed this year. So we're very fortunate to be in that position. Um, and most of these alfalfas uh, can go most places and will succeed under a lot of different rotational considerations. Yeah, I would say the big difference here. So like the 340M is more for a three cut system. Uh, 3,800 three or four cut system and the, the, the elite alfalfa is on the previous page, like the 372 or the 444 can, can handle more cuttings than that. So four or even five cut systems. So you're going to get, that's where most of your additional tonnage comes from is in those, those intense rotations where you're cutting um, the alfalfa more often. Um, so, um, like I said, availability is, is very good. Um, we had good seed yields out of Canada this year, which is pretty surprising because they 
experienced just as severe a drought as, as we did in the, in the prairie states. And across the board, our pricing is mostly flat on most of our alfalfas. Um, then just really quick here, we're gonna kind of gloss over these last two um, before we launch into the break here. Um, as everyone experienced, this is not new to anybody. Uh, 2021 was a pretty challenging production year. Uh, we had good small grain yield and quality, which I would have bet against uh, big time this year. But, you know, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, we had very good um, both yields and test weights and germinations of all of our small grains. Um, as you move farther west, that story changes a lot. So folks in North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, up into Canada had uh, extremely poor crops just due to the, the drought stress tolerance. So that is definitely gonna pinch supply. The market for organic oats, if anybody's paying attention, has uh, jumped quite a lot, um, even in the last three to four weeks. Um, so we expect that supply will, will be tight. Uh, we have a good supply of seed as of right now, but we, we expect as we move into spring that that's gonna tighten up quite a bit. Um, Matt, um, did, there was a question, Matt. Hey, Elia, if you're on the, could you please unmute Elia? Uh, Stan, Stan asked if, if uh, those, the 444, the 372, and the 320 LH are all going to have apex green on them, and I didn't know the answer. It, it seems like maybe one of them is not. So if, Ilya, if you're not on or if you can't unmute yourself, we'll have, Stan, we'll have Ilya get back to you after the call, I guess. Yeah, in the interest of time, uh, we'll just, we'll, Stan will have Ilya get back to you. And then one hey, thing guys, I was going to. Sorry, I was, I was on the phone. Can you hear me? Yep, yep. we got you. Yeah, sorry about that. Yes, all every single alfalfa we carry this year, with the exception of the high jest, which we're closing out, uh, will be Omri coated with Apex Green. We're also adding for the first time this year Saberex SA to it, which I think is going to be a big upgrade because now we'll have not only a better inoculant in that seed coating. Um, as well as the trichoderma fungi as well. So I, I feel like our seed coatings got an update, uh, an upgrade this year and pretty much all the high-end alfalfas we carry will have that seed coating on it. Great, thanks Celia. One thing I was gonna add on small grains, I do expect we will sell out of some things in particular, barley is gonna be really, barley seed is gonna be very tight. I think triticale seed is also gonna be very tight. Um, I think we'll have enough organic oats to get us through the season. At least that's the way it feels right now. And so just as another snapshot here, um, you know, the same conditions that impacted small grain yields are also going to um, impact organic uh, grasses. And I would, I would just highlight a few grasses because we have very good production um, coming over from Europe where a lot of organic grass seed is, is grown and uh, cleaned, which we do have several varieties that are coming in from the EU, but production in Oregon uh, was, was dinged very bad due to the drought. So we have a good supply of most of our organic grasses, uh, but I would call out there's basically gonna be uh, slim to none organic Timothy, organic brome. Uh, the other thing that's gonna be very, very short this year is organic medium red clover again, uh, there is some production in the upper Midwest, but a lot of that production does come out of uh, Oregon and the Willamette Valley. So uh, very, very short supply on those things. Uh, but we will have organic red clover coming in from the EU, uh, but it's going to be delayed in its arrival. Uh, so definitely something you want to probably stick your name on something sooner rather than later. And uh, correspondingly, prices for those various things are going to be uh, up as well. Hey, uh, Eli, if you're on the call, there's a question in the chat box. Any idea on the supply of conventional medium red clover? Yeah, so conventional medium red clover is extremely tight, as you can see from that drought map that's up. Pretty much all, product, all production of everything west of the Missouri River was just a disaster this year. Organic Timothy, Brome, medium red clover, uh, is extremely short conventionally as well as organically. Um, we are in a good position on medium red clover. I feel like we've got a good supply of it. Um, so we'll have it, uh, but be prepared for some pretty shocking prices on all of, all of that stuff. Yeah, unfortunately that's, it's supply and demand on a lot of this stuff. 
That's, the exception is corn, is actually corn this year where we haven't raised our organic uh, hybrid seed corn prices at all, but a lot of this other stuff is much higher. Great. So with that, I uh, just want to say thanks to Mac and to Elia um, for jumping in on short notice here. Um, so we're going to take a quick break.